This is an important car for MG. G'day, my name's Matt. This channel's called The Right Car. This here is the new generation HS mid-sized SUV. So it competes with some big name players in the Australian market. And hey, I'll tell you everything that you need to know about whether this car will be the right car for you in this review. Things like pricing and specs. I'll also tell you the safety stuff you need to know about, the interior space, fuel consumption, ownership, and a whole lot more. So if you haven't already, please do hit like, subscribe, and ring the bell to keep up to date with all of my content. And let's take a look at this new HS. The MG HS has always been about value and there is still plenty on offer in this vehicle for the new generation model. There's still three different versions available. The entry level model is called the Vibe and you'll see the price for it on your screen now. It shares the same powertrain as the higher spec models, which I'll tell you a little bit more about soon. And it has plenty of standard safety technology and equipment, which I'll cover off when we get to that as well. But even on the base grade, you're getting things like 18 inch alloy wheels, wheels, LED lighting all around the car. There's a pretty classy looking cloth trim on the inside and a pair of big screens, including one with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto and your driver info screen as well. To me, it looks pretty good at a glance. And in fact, you might be basically ticking the box for everything you need if that is the sort of price that you're looking to pay. But if you can spend a little more, you can find yourself in the Excite grade, which does have a few extra features. It adds things like 19 inch alloy wheels, sat nav, front fog lights, a 360 degree camera, and just like the base model, it also has digital radio and a six speaker sound system. And if you buy this top spec version, which is called the Essence, you're getting a few more features for your extra monies, including a big glass roof, which looks bloody brilliant, in fact. And just like the mid-spec model, you're also getting the fake leather trim on the inside. All grades come with a fake leather steering wheel as well. And this version also has seat heating, a power tailgate, dual zone climate control, Control, a bit more electric adjustment for the seats, rear parking sensors, rear privacy glass, door mirror memory settings as well, and electrically adjustable folding heated door mirrors too. So on paper, this car seems to stack up really, really well for what you're paying, but let's talk about some alternatives that you might also want to consider. So you're thinking about a mid-size SUV. There are lots of bloody good ones in this class and I'll tell you a few of my favorites right now. First, the old stalwart, the Toyota RAV4. I still think that it stacks up well, despite the fact that it is showing its age a little bit, but the fact that it's got hybrids with all wheel drive and front wheel drive, and it just seems to make a lot of sense uh, from the family friendliness perspective as well. It's a great size, has a big boot, and is super duper fuel efficient as well. And it's backed by the biggest network of dealerships and workshops across Australia, and that's why it's so bloody popular. Second, I would say the Honda CRV range. Now, it is a little bit on the pricey side as you step up the range, and the hybrid version is quite expensive, but it does feel really good inside. It's got plenty of space, and it's really nice to drive, no matter whether you choose the hybrid or the turbo petrol versions, and there's a few of those to choose from as well. I really highly rate the CRV. I think it's definitely worth a look if you're not sold on the Toyota and you're not sold on this, go and check one of those out. And finally, I reckon you should also go and have a look at the Hyundai Tucson. It's just been updated and it has a few new additions, including a hybrid powertrain as well. And it will be pretty good on fuel. I've uh, spent a bit of time in one recently, seeing less than six liters per 100 in mixed driving. So it is properly real world efficient. And there's a heap of different variants available, but the pricing on it is creeping up as well. So which one would you pick? Does this one sing your song? It looks so different to the last HS, and I'm okay with that. In fact, I would say it looks quite similar to a BYD Sea Lion 6, which I've done a review of. You'll find a link in the description. Um, that plug-in hybrid model, well, I thought it was pretty attractive. I think this is more attractive. I think it's got a really nice design to it. And yes, 18 inch wheels on the low spec version, 19s on this top grade model. I think it looks pretty sharp and it doesn't look too try hard with those finishes around the wheel arches. I think that's because they're shiny rather than matte plastic. And at the back, this elongated tail light finish is really quite pretty. Righto, let's take a look in the boot. It's got a traditionally positioned 
boot opening button. Yes, this one has an electric tailgate. And you can see for yourself that it's a very squared off space, which makes loading things in a lot easier than some other vehicles, which might have cavities on the side. Look, this still has little spaces on the side with cargo nets. There's a light in the back as well. There's another cargo netted space over here as well. No shopping bag hooks, which I'm a bit of a downer on. I think that all cars should have shopping bag hooks you might think differently. Uh, and there's also this cargo cover with a nice channel uh, in the sides there for it to run its way back. Now, in here, you might be thinking, oh no, no spare wheel. But actually, there is one. Let me just pull this up, if I can do it, just one sec. Yep, there it is, under there. It's a space saver, as you can see. It's really quite squeaky, that polystyrene stuff. Let me put it back. Ah, there we go. Yes, okay, so I think that this is definitely gonna be suitable for a family in terms of the space in there. It's actually not too bad at all. I feel like I've seen this movie before, the whole big screen, big screen, pretty black looking interior. Yeah, it's not necessarily pushing any boundaries, this car. Not like a BYD or something like that. And look, that will be perfectly fine for people who are stepping up from something a bit older. Um, but look, there are still some things that could be better about this interior, despite the fact that it does have the big twin 12.3 inch screen displays, which are pretty wow factor. There's the digital driver info display here, which has a number of different settings and menus and so forth on it as well. And you can jump through those using these controls on the steering wheel just like some of the other mgs i've tested those are still a piano black finish which i don't love because it means that they show up a bit of fingerprinty yuckness and you've also got some controls on this side of the steering wheel that's your cruise control button and you can adjust the distance for the adaptive cruise depending on how far you want it uh, using this button here now there's also a star button here and that is a favorites button so at the moment it's set for the surround view camera so you can just quickly at a glance see what's all around you now that gives us a chance to have a look at this big touchscreen media system which is very very different to the existing hs and look there's plenty of stuff here to look at. Um, I won't spend hours and hours on this. I could because there's a lot to go through, but some of the settings and stuff that you will wanna potentially switch off if you don't like some of the safety systems are a bit buried. So um, if you wanna turn off something like the speed limit recognition, which turns on every single time you drive the car, you have to hit that button there. There's also the emergency lane keep, which you can actually just turn off by using the favorite switch there. Um, but then again, you still have to press the screen a couple of times. Uh, and you've also got your driver drowsiness detection. So that's that little camera right there that keeps an eye on your eyes. And I've heard people say that you can just put a bit of black tape over the top of it, but um, yeah. I don't know about that. Uh, look, there's other stuff in here for your settings. You can change the displays and so forth. Um, you've got your settings to personalize the car a little bit more. So that's like I said, that little star switch. You can put it the 360 camera. Um, look, that's all great to see, I think. And there's driving adjustments as well. So you can adjust the steering to be normal or sporty. Um, and there's a towing mode as well. Now let's have a look at some of the other things that you can play with in this car. Yep, it's got sat nav built in in this top grade version if that's what you want to play with. Um, and annoyingly though, uh, if you want to App Connect, if you want to use Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, you've still got to plug in to a USB A port, which is a bit weird, but that's just how it is with this car. Um, maybe wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto will come at some point, but at this point in time, no bueno. Uh, now, there's radio, as you would expect as well, AM, FM, and DAB, so that's good to see. And your climate controls, mm, yeah, that's a bit of a problem, right? So you've got a couple of buttons under here. You've got your on-off button for the air conditioning and a home button and demisters. I mean, they'll be handy on cooler mornings, but um, yes, there is no fan dial. There is no temperature adjustment button. And I think that it is a worse car for that, to be honest. Um, you can do it through the screen, like in a lot of other new Chinese vehicles. A lot of it is through the screen because screens are cheaper than knobs and dials. And that's just how it is. Um, they have to achieve those profits somehow, right? So look, it's a adjustable thing. You can go up to 
turn it up to 11 if you bloody want to using the fan uh, and there's obviously dual zone climate control in this grade you've got seat heating buttons there as well um, which probably aren't working because the car's not on and yes there's also an air filter as well so all of that stuff is pretty good i'll turn that off so it's not making as much noise and look i think that you will get used to that screen but just keep in mind that you will have to do a lot through that screen. All right, let's look at some of the other things in this cabin. So like I said, there's a couple of USB-A ports down there. You've got decent sized cup holders, in fact. The shifter is a pretty conventional looking unit with a park button, and it's one that doesn't actually have any sort of detents or anything. You just sort of pull it down to go to drive and up into reverse. Uh, here, you'll find an auto hold button and an electric park brake, and also a hill descent mode, if that's what you need for whatever situation you're in. There's a wireless phone charger only in the top spec, which I think is a little bit disappointing. And in there, you'll see my USB cable and the key for the car, which is a small storage tray as well. You've got decent sized seats. They are pretty comfortable, I have to say. And the material, look, it's, as I said, it's a fake leather trim, but it's nice and soft and supple and comfortable enough. Um, and look, on the sides here, you've got this nice finish on the armrests or the door cards, soft elbow pads as well. And in here, a decent, well, not mega, but decent glove box. There's bottle holders in the doors as well. So I think that generally it's a pretty nice cabin experience. I like the shape of this steering wheel too. One thing I just want to point out though, is that you don't get an auto dimming rear view mirror. It's just one of the flicky ones and it's actually a bit flimsy. And there's no remote button to open the boot from inside, which isn't ideal. All right, just have a look at that. There are some large SUVs that have less room than that in between the driver's seat and my knees. Now, this driver's seat is set for me, 182 centimeters, six foot. And yes, I've got heaps and heaps of room. There's ample foot wiggle room as well and it's a flat floor too so that means that you can fit three adults across the back here and yes you can and also it's very amenable for the kiddos as well there are iso fix points in the window seats and three top tether points as well plus you'll also find a pair of cup holders in the middle here in this fold down armrest bottle holders in the doors map pockets Directional air vents, and yes, there are USB ports down there as well. So, hey, I think that this could be a really good fit for most people's needs. And just have a look at the headroom, 180 centimeters. Like I said, yes, plenty, plenty of space, even with this lovely big glass roof as well. And one thing that I like about this car, grab handles and lights at the side. Love that. And another thing I really like about it, this seat is super squishy. I love comfy back seats, and this car has one. Nice one. All versions of the HS currently on sale in Australia are powered by a 1.5 litre four-cylinder turbo petrol engine. And while that might sound a little bit small in terms of the size of this car, it does have pretty decent power and torque figures. You'll see them on your screen now. It comes as standard with a seven-speed dual-clutch automatic transmission, and it's front-wheel drive only at this point in time. There might be all-wheel drive models later on. And in fact, speaking of later on, there might be a new plug-in hybrid version as well, which could be a really good fit depending on your user case. Now, if you're wondering about towing capacity, yes, it can tow. It has 750 kilo unbrake towing capacity. So, is it good to drive? Well, let's find out, shall we? Now, I drove the existing version of the MG HS extensively in the past, and shh, shh, it's not a school zone. Sorry, we're gonna be interrupted a little bit in this review because I've left all the safety systems on. So, um, if it beeps and bongs, it's getting it wrong. Ah, uh, well, maybe not, but I'm getting it wrong, maybe. Um, look, I think that the safety systems in this car are the biggest thing that detracts from the drive experience, in fact, because if you're like me and you don't like being told what to do, um, and I don't like being told what to do, there's lots of things in this car that might give you the shits. Like that speed sign recognition system, which at times gets it wrong because it thinks that it's a 50 zone or a 40 zone or vice versa, depending on the school time. 
and also this driver monitoring camera system which if you are looking at the screen or looking at something in the car for slightly longer than a glimpse it seems to think that well no you're distracted and you're being a dangerous person and you should not be driving anywhere ever again yep that sort of thing shits me uh, so I tend to turn those things off when I drive this car and I've done it every single time I've gotten in except for this time because I want to show you how interruptive they might be in some situation. Sometimes they won't be. Look, just depends on how I'm driving. I'm driving pretty sedately right now. So otherwise, look, the drive experience itself is good. It's got a really comfortable ride to this car. It can be a little bit thumpy at times, a little bit firm feeling, particularly at the rear. Um, but. I do find that it's comfy enough in mixed scenarios. I just drove it back from the city and I was, you know, pleasantly comfortable on the freeway. And also uh, around town, it does seem to do a pretty good job of handling the bumps and lumps in the surface. Yeah, like I said, you can feel some of those really jarring sharp edges will be transmitted into the cabin, but it's not too bad. And the steering, I mean, you've got that multi-mode steering, so you can put it into sport mode if you want to, but in normal mode, it's actually pretty good as well. It's just livable and likable and sorry for the beeping. Yes. Uh, it's, yeah, it's a pretty good thing to steer around. And that steering is reactive enough. It's quick enough in terms of the responsiveness and it's quick enough in terms of the engine as well. Look, it is a pretty punchy engine. It is a pretty punchy engine. And like, you know, I think that this sort of car needs a decent amount of grunt because if you are hauling a full family and their stuff, it's not a 40 zone. You will find that it is imperative that you have a decent amount of grunt available to you. And even though it is just a front wheel drive with a seven speed dual clutch automatic, um, I think that it does get away pretty well. And I mean, you might find that the front tires can spin a little bit under really hard acceleration, but in stop start situations, it behaves pretty well. Um, and I wasn't a big fan of the existing dual clutch in the HS, I don't think anyone was, uh, but this seems to be much more well mannered, let's say. We'll just do a little hill start here to see for ourselves. So, yep, off we go. <laughs> yeah, so it will squeal those tires and it does have a bit of lag to contend with, but it's pretty smooth in terms of the way that it actually builds the speed when you do take away from a standstill. I'll do another one here. But yeah, no, that gets away pretty well. And that's the thing with it. It's improved in terms of the day-to-day -day drivability and that makes it a more compelling choice than it ever was. You can hear the engine a little bit. You don't get too much tire roar in the cabin or anything though. So it is pretty enjoyable for distance commuting. And apart from the fact that those safety systems sort of get on my nerves, this is a good little car. And it goes pretty well. So it goes pretty well, it turns pretty well, and it holds onto the road pretty well. It also stops pretty well, which is a good thing to know. And look, I think that it is a rather honest drive experience. I am a bit surprised. I didn't know whether I'd love it to start with. I don't know if I love it yet, but I do like it. I do think that it's ticking plenty of boxes in terms of the drive experience, but safety stuff. Don't like that. All right, let's talk about fuel consumption. On your screen, you'll see the official combined cycle fuel number for the HS range, and that is pretty good. And if you can achieve it, I'm sure you'll be happy. But um, in my experience, during my test drive of this car, it's a little higher, um, and my driving included urban, mixed driving, bit of freeway, bit of commuting, that sort of stuff as well. So I reckon you can basically bank on seeing a similar number yourself, and if you're wondering, it does have the requirement for 95 Ron premium unleaded petrol. So it might cost a little more each time you go and fill it up. And the fuel tank capacity is on your screen now. So you can do the maths and figure out how much it might cost each time you need to fill up. There's no ANCAP or Euro ANCAP rating at the time I'm filming this for the new generation HS, but every single version of this vehicle comes comprehensively equipped with plenty of active safety technology. Some of it is great, 
some of it is not. Okay, so it's got autonomous emergency braking with pedestrian, cyclist, and junction detection. There's also an active lane keeping assistance feature with emergency lane keeping, which you can turn off if you don't like it. I don't like it, so I do turn it off. Thankfully, there's a quick drop down to turn that one off. But there's also a driver monitoring camera system, which takes a little bit more work to turn off. It really doesn't uh, gel with me and there's speed sign recognition as well plus you get adaptive cruise control there's uh, blind spot monitoring and recross traffic alert and this top spec version gets a really really good surround view camera system parking sensors around the car as well plenty of airbags on offer inside as well in case of an accident things like dual front front side full-length curtain and a front center airbag as well so in theory should be pretty safe MG Australia recently introduced a class-leading 10-year, 250,000-kilometre warranty for its vehicle range, including the new HS, which is fantastic. For someone who's looking for value, I think a 10-year warranty does add to the value factor. And also, there's a cap price servicing plan for this vehicle. It's a bloody long one too. And long roadside assistance as well. Now, all of that does add to the ownership aspect of this car, and it's not conditional like the Mitsubishi 10-year warranty either. So you don't have to service with Mitsubishi to keep your warranty cover. You can service it wherever you want, although MG obviously would like you to service with the brand so they can keep an eye on everything and make sure that it's running tip-top, and also make sure that it's been receiving genuine parts rather than something else that might be fitted by someone else. But anyway, what do you think? 10-year warranty? Bloody unreal, I think. I have no doubt that this will be more successful than the last HS was. It's more refined, it's more spacious, and offers a lot more to like when it comes to the ownership stuff as well. So, do you think you'd go for a HS? I'd love to know your thoughts. I'm pretty impressed by it. I think the lack of all-wheel drive and no hybrid powertrain yet could be a bit of a downer, but hey, I guess we'll have to wait and see. And what do you think of the price? Let me know in the comments section. I'd love to hear from you. If you have already subscribed, Thank you so much, it does mean a lot. And if you've rung the bell, that means even more because you'll keep up to date with all of my content. Thanks for doing so, and if you haven't, please do. All right, thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.